Every kid wants to be a hero, or maybe a villain, in case the world hasn't been nice enough to you. But every once in a while, there's some goofy nutjob who's too self-absorbed in their own power fantasies to care about what's cool and what's not. This is the story of one such individual. It all starts with the introduction of a gorgeous girl named Akane. She wakes up and gets ready, then leaves for school in her Lambo. That's right, you know, she's super rich and important. You see, Akane is an actress on top of being a high school student. As you can imagine, everyone loves her sweet smile and kind persona. The boys would do anything for her. She seems beautiful both inside and out. However, there's still one student in the entire school who doesn't worship her. His name is Minoru Kageno, and for the most part, he's indifferent to everyone, including Akane. He doesn't even know her name, despite the fact that she sits right next to him in class. Because of this, he starts living in her head rent-free. Okay, so back to Akane, and why she tries so hard to make people like her. It's because of a tragic event that happened back when she first started out in the showbiz industry. She was just a middle school girl at that time. Unfortunately, a stalker abducted her and then took her to his place. He was going to force himself upon her when fortunately, she was saved. But, you know, PTSD is a thing. It messed with her psyche so much that she ended up developing this fake persona of a perfect girl so that everyone likes her, be it a teacher, a student, or anyone else. Though as fate would have it, her driver's still not here to pick her up, which leaves her with no choice but to walk on foot. The problem is that this gives her bad vibes, because she has literally never walked alone since that incident in middle school. Besides, what she doesn't know is that her driver was beaten to death by some local gangsters. They were waiting for her. Of course. When she enters an empty street, they use a handkerchief to knock her out and then take her to an empty warehouse. But just as her consciousness is fading away, she notices a person standing in the distance. It's Kageno, and he's smiling. Akane then wakes up in a warehouse, scared and confused. The gangsters want money from her parents, but one of them tries to have his way with her. This gives our girl extreme flashbacks of the stalker incident and completely petrifies her. But right then, at that very moment, someone breaks into the warehouse from the glass ceiling and introduces himself as the stylish ruffian slayer. He violates this man's face. This causes the other guy to step in, and unlike the garbage he had just taken out, the other guy's pretty strong. Ruthlessly strong. He's an ex-military officer, and even more than that, he has a kink for violence. He enjoys it. But this meant nothing in front of the stylish Russian Slayer. The Slayer does him so bad that it cures the man's fetish for violence. Even when the officer can't physically go on any longer, the Slayer doesn't stop. He changes the very structure of the officer's face using crowbars. I would not recommend watching this scene with kids around. Anyway, Akane is freed, the Russian Slayer tells her to be careful, and then excuses himself. All is well that ends well, because Akane's parents use their power to neatly cover everything up. Of course, she hasn't forgotten about the Russian Slayer and wonders who he is. And the next day at school, Kageno leaves her speechless by actually remembering her name. Now, if this was your usual psychological drama type of anime, this would have been the start of yet another complicated relationship. But it's not. It's a sweet isekai. Kageno dies an NPC death, and everyone forgets about him. Though this is good, because he's now on his way to the fantasy land on the Isekai Express. This is the point of the story where we get more context about Kageno. You see, for as long as he can remember, Kageno wanted to be a secret hero. Honestly, a lot of kids do, but while others eventually buy into the modern day nonsense, he never did. At school, he played the role of a background character in school, but during the night, he was a menace who went around town and annihilated gangs one after another. But that was it. Yeah, he exerted a stupid amount of effort into learning martial arts and various other survival skills. Thanks to that, he can kick some local gang ass, but that'll be his limit. He'll never be able to fight armed men, and even if he somehow does manage to win, he can be squashed with a nuke. That's right, he just used to be an ordinary human. But after getting killed by Truck Coon, Kageno finds himself in the arms of a beautiful, noble lady. He has been reborn in a noble family as Sid Kageno. Time continues to pass as Sid gradually begins to get accustomed to this new world. He decides to keep his past life a secret and doesn't even flex on that crazy martial arts and other physical tricks he learned back when he used to hunt biker gangs. He also has an older sister. Her name is Claire, and unlike him, who's making sure to stay out of the spotlight, she's praised by everyone for her good abilities and work ethic. Good. 
That's just the way Sid likes it. Now, believe it or not, this man actually continues his nighttime routine. Even after death, he still goes out and hunts bandits for one. One day, he finds an ugly, caged creature. It's obvious that the creature is under some cursed spell. Sid tries a bunch of things and actually succeeds in removing the curse from this unpleasant creature. You can probably imagine my surprise when it turns out to be a stunning, blonde elf. It appears that she has a memory loss, though. Sid sees this as the perfect chance to make her his subordinate. He starts telling her the story of some ancient heroes who fought against demons. He affirms that she's a descendant of those heroes, and now the demons are after her. Indeed, he pulls this story out of thin air, but it was authentic enough to convince her. Her name is Alpha, and just like that, the two of them kickstart a secret organization called Shadow Garden. They only have one goal, and that is to stop the demon cult from resurrecting the demon king, Diabolos. Sid was enjoying this a little too much. Three years pass by in the blink of an eye, and it's about time for Sid's brilliant sister to leave for the academy. As fate would have it, she disappears. Or rather, she's abducted by someone. In wake of this, Alpha shows up. She has recruited a few more girls in the past three years and formed up a team called Shadow 7. They immediately commence the search to find Sid's sister and also assert that it was the cult of the demons who kidnapped her. The cult believes that Claire is actually a descendant of the heroes, so their plan is to use her body to revive the great demon king Diabolos. Alpha and the others are telling the truth. As crazy as it may seem, that story that Sid pulled out of nothing is the truth. The cult is real. It is indeed trying to revive Diabolos, and yes, it was the them who kidnapped his sister. However, Sid just thinks that these girls are playing along, and so he plays along some more. Together with them, he attacks their hideout. Shadow Garden invades and gets rid of them. The ruckus allows Claire to escape as well, and so she does. She has no idea that it was her little brother who saved her, but at least she made it back home. Following this, Claire leaves for the academy. Sid is excited to eventually leave too, but it'll take two more years before he's 15 and old enough to enter the Midgar Academy. Sadly, Alpha then reveals that the girls will have to leave as well so that they can expand their operations considering how the Cult of Diabolos is a global organization. Sid still thinks it's not real. He also wonders if the girls have realized that it was all just the story he came up with. This makes him wonder if they're now using the organization as an excuse to part ways and be free. Be that as it may, he bids them farewell. And the flow of time continues. Sid turns 15 and is finally on his way to enter the academy. His plan is to play the NPC role so he makes sure to look for the other two guys who feel the most average when making friends. But here's where it takes a sharp turn. Like every school ever, there's always that one popular girl that every guy has a crush on, but she just takes their soul and leaves them permanently scarred for life. In this case, her name is Alexia, and she's from the royal family. Okay, so what happens is Sid doesn't do well on the test. His friends go tell him to ask Alexia out. He's gonna get rejected, that goes without saying, but it still sounds like a fun little date. Sid humors them. He later walks up to her, then confesses his love in the most ordinary way possible. There's literally no spark of authenticity whatsoever. The reason Sid did this is because he wants to continue playing a background character, but somehow the stars align and the sun swallows the moon because she accepts his confession. Looks like she had been waiting for someone like him. When they're alone, she shares her story, how oh, she's the fiancé of their royal fencing instructor. In many ways, her fiancé is high up in social hierarchy. He's an elite, and if one is thinking logically, she shouldn't have a reason to not be with him. However, she doesn't want to marry him. Not even close. The guy acts too perfect, which gives her bad vibes. And so she wants Sid to be her boyfriend for the time being. It's for the sake of getting away from her fiancé. Sid realizes that it'll be more trouble than it's worth. She's like the most popular and ruthless girl in their class, which is why she declines, but when she offers him some money, our boy turns into her little puppy dog. That's right, money is everything. And he definitely needs some of that to run his secret intelligence organization. From this point forward, Alexia and Sid start spending time together, but during their sword training when she reveals how she's not very good at it and Sid reassures her that she is good, she states that her sister told her the same thing. Something about what Sid said pissed her off. She left for the day, and didn't return. Looks like she went missing, because the next thing you know, Sid gets arrested, since you know he was the last person with her before she disappeared. But Sid doesn't have anything to do with her disappearance. In actuality, she was taken by, you guessed it, the cult. The next morning, we see some mad scientist having a field day sucking her blood. He believes that her blood has some useful demonic DNA, and so he's trying to confirm his theory. 
Sid, on the other hand, is getting tortured by the academic knights. They're being as aggressive as possible to try to make him spill the beans, and yes, they're enjoying it as well because, you know, torture people, torture. Torture is supposed to hurt, so Sid acts like he's hurting, but little do they know, this level of pain is nothing to him. He's already developed an inhumane level of pain tolerance. After about five days, Alexia's older sister, Princess Iris, orders them to release the guy. He was innocent after all. Following this, Alpha shows up in his room with some big news. She shares the progress their organization has made, how they're actively observing the cult, how this is relevant to Alexia's disappearance, and Sid's glad that Alpha is still playing along with their little story. When Quinn. There was no time to waste, though. They had to go save Alexia, and fast. Alpha prepares a group of 114 soldiers, and so the rescue operation commences. On their way, Sid finds those knights who enjoyed torturing him, and so he kills them. No remorse or guilt whatsoever. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our noble protagonist. Going back to the cell where Alexia is locked up, that mad scientist then injects Alexia's blood into a mutant girl. It doesn't go as planned because the mutant transforms into a rogue demon and kills said scientist. Alexia sees this as her chance to escape, but ends up coming across her fiancé. Plot twist moment. That means the guy that gave Alexia to the cult was none other than her fiancé. His goal was to become a member of the Knights of the Rounds, and Alexia's blood seemed to be the price. Without thinking, Alexia attacks him, but considering what she had to endure because of the mad scientist, she was too exhausted to do anything. Lucky for her, a man appears from the shadows. It's the shadow. Or at least that's what Sid introduces himself as. The fraud fiancé couldn't help but realize that the one who's been opposing them all this time, the shadow, is this man. He goes on to reveal himself to be one of the most important members of the cult, and very soon he'll become the twelfth seat of the rounds. Meanwhile, the mutant monster girl is causing chaos and havoc all around the city. Princess Iris confronts her, but no matter how hard she tries to attack or defeat her, the monster girl just keeps regenerating. Alpha soon shows up, introduces herself as a member of Shadow Garden, rids the monster girl from her suffering by helping her revert back to her human self, and then leaves. Going back to Sid, he's overpowering the fiancé using his impeccable sword skills. Alexia hasn't quite realized that he is Sid, but still, she's impressed by his sword skills nonetheless. As a last resort, the fiancé consumes some demon pills to awaken and get stronger, but Sid just nukes him out of existence along with the surroundings literally. When everything goes back to normal, Alexia has acquired a newfound inspiration to master her own sword style. This is in the wake of seeing the shadow nuke the living daylights out of her fiancé. She also recalls how Sid complimented her sword style, and well, she offers him the privilege of being her real boyfriend. He declines, but then gets punished for it by Alexia. She goes hardcore and leaves behind a lot mess while she was punishing Sid. As for the Shadow Garden, they rejoice because of how powerful Shadow was in this recent incident, but their attention soon shifts when they realize how another group is committing crimes while posing as Shadow Garden. Princess Iris, on the other hand, is curious about both the Cult of Diablos and the Shadow Garden. Of course she is, her sister's fiancé turned out to be a member of the cult after all, and so she forms an investigation team. Then there's Sid. He survived Alexia's onslaught. He's walking away, covered in blood, when he comes across a pink-haired cutie named named Sherry, and she is like the most brilliant mind in the kingdom. She's then asked by Iris if she can decipher a strange artifact they found that belongs to the cult. Sid meets his two friends, their names are Poe and Skell by the way, and the three of them go to a place to get some chocolate which they're then going to use to get girls. A flawless plan if I must say so myself. Though it soon turns out that the one who runs the store is Gamma, a girl from the Shadow 7 squad. She's running it to secure more funding for their organization. Sid is obviously impressed and applauds Gamma's dedication to play along. Little does he know that this is just one of these stores. He had stores in every city around the world, and is quite literally among the wealthiest people alive. No kidding. Gamma introduces Sid to a new member named Nu. She's Gamma's personal assistant. Sid appreciates it, then asks Gamma for three cheap chocolates. Though of course she gives him the most expensive ones, but Sid being Sid, he laughs with Gamma and sneakily steals a silver coin. Then, as they're on the way home, Danger sees them in the face. Sid notices that it's Alpha fighting a bunch of suspicious people, but he needed to shake off his two friends before intervening himself. He just tells them he's gotta go take a poop, and he needs to do it right away. The two of them understand where he's coming from. They applaud his manhood and affirm that no matter what happens, they'll never forget about him. Anyway, he saves Alexia by killing the ones who are overpowering her. He takes one of them as hostage and tells New to interrogate them. He then has a conversation with Alexia where she explains the fake Shadow Garden and how it's been killing people using their name. Alexia reassures Sid that the real Shadow 7 has done nothing wrong. 
Later, Sid's friends use the chocolates to get girls. Skell gets wrecked by the girl's fiance, while Poe is labeled a stalker and then arrested. Sid also wonders if he should give the chocolates to anyone. Coincidentally, he comes across Sherry and casually gives it to her. Well, Sherry's adoptive father is the vice principal. He breaks the news to his silly daughter that the chocolates are probably a love confession and that she should give Sid an answer. Moving on, New explains that the person she interrogated was a brainwashed orphan. The cult uses drugs and magic to turn such people into foot soldiers. There's another one named Rex, who's been lurking around the city. So when Sid starts talking about the sword tournament that's about to happen at his academy and how his friends see this as an opportunity to impress girls, New takes his words out of context and mistakenly deduces that Sid is going to deal with Rex. The sword fighting festival takes place and Sid ends up fighting Princess Rosé, the student council president. He wasn't going to give himself away, which is why he needs to pretend to get injured several times until finally the referee declares his loss. The princess is still kind of impressed with his zeal though. Then there's Sherry. She's been overthinking the chocolate lately and ends up telling Sid that they should start by being friends. But believe me as I say this, Sid doesn't even remember her name. She then also asks Alexia about it just what her relationship is with Sid. Alexia states that their relationship was fake, and well, it was, since Sid declined when she genuinely wanted to be his girlfriend. Sherry rejoices. While Alexia is upset to see another girl showing so much interest in someone who's supposed to be her boyfriend, five days later, when Sid shows up at school, Princess Rosé Oriana tells him about the vacant seat at the student council. But Sid's attention is swayed when someone puts a barrier around their school. He's the only one who notices, and it appears he can no longer use magic. Magic. Then some sketchy men show up in the academy, claim that they're from the Shadow Garden, and declare that it's a takeover. Princess Rosé tries to hold them off, but because she couldn't use magic, she never stood a chance. Her sword is broken, and she's injured to the point where near death is in sight, but just before they're about to land a finishing blow, Sid jumps in and takes the attack himself, cloaked in blood. He falls onto the ground. In his head, he thought that saving a girl while fighting terrorists is a really cool and heroic thing to do, but Rose, being a sweet maiden, gets the impression that he loves her. But he's dead, so there's that. The other students go to the auditorium, and when no one's looking, Sid restarts his heart using magic. Then there's the soldier who New talked about. She invades Sherry's room and attempts to take the relic from her, but fortunately, Princess Iris's Crimson Knights help her to get away. Sid, on the other hand, is having a good time killing all these imposters, he also protects Sherry. Sherry then observes the relic, which caused the barrier. She explains that it's the Eye of Avarice. It'll keep absorbing magic until it explodes and takes everyone with it. Fortunately, the relic Sherry was asked to research is the Eye's control unit, so she starts trying to do something about it, and Sid also helps her get the stuff she requires. Subsequently, that Rex guy from before talks to the mastermind behind all of this, the man referred to as Gaunt Knight. Rex mentions that their men are getting killed left and right, and so Gaunt wonders if the real Shadow garden is after them. His goal is to become a member of the knights once again, but Sid then kills Rex. New is around as well, and guess what? Only one of the Crimson Knights survives. The one who survives turns out to be New's ex. She got hit by a truck of emotions and wonders if it's about time she kills the guy and moves on. But thanks to Sid's orders to not do anything until Sherry has it all figured out, New stops and she lets the guy live as well. Finally, Sherry is done with the control relic. It takes off the barrier, which means that they're now free to use magic as much as they want. Sid takes on his shadow disguise and tells his girls to slaughter the terrorists. They are ruthless. Princess Iris still believes that the Shadow Garden is their real enemy. Now prepare yourself for another plot twist because the leader of the fake Shadow Garden and the mastermind behind this attack on the Academy is none other than Sherry's adoptive father, the Vice Principal. Gaunt Knight is just a pseudonym. His real name is, of course, Ruslan. Sid finds him burning all of Sherry's research and it sort of snowballs into Ruslan telling Sid his story. He states that he used to be a master swordsman who showed great promise, but then an illness nerfed him. Since then, he put his faith into the eye. He saw it as the only way to get his health back in order. This is why he ended up with Sherry's mother, who was basically researching the eye. But the man killed her when she didn't want to continue the research and then turned Sherry into his pawn so that the research could go on. However, now that everything is in order and Sherry has combined both the eye and the relic, Ruslan is able to use it to get back what he had once lost. But who cares? Sid is still a way better swordsman anyway. Ruslan realizes that this is the end for him, so he boasts about how he tarnished the Shadow Garden name, but Sid just kills him. 
he couldn't care less. Sherry shows up and starts crying because her father was, well, brutally slayed. Sid knows that being an anti-hero means you safeguard people from the truth, and so he chooses to not say anything about Rosalind. But for what it's worth, Shadow is wanted for mass murder, arson, kidnapping, and robbery. He's the number one enemy to the kingdom. Shadow embraces this, though. Gamma later tells Alpha that he is fully willing to take on the remorse of the masses. Alpha admires his resolve and realizes that they must redecide their approach. As for Sherry, she bids Sid farewell and goes abroad to study something. When Sid asks about what she's going to study, she replies that it's a secret. Well, that gives Sid some bad vibes. Next up, we have the trip to Lindworm. Sid is asked by Alpha to visit this sacred city. Alexia and her sister Iris also plan on visiting the place. In preparation, they go to one of Sid's department stores where Alexia buys a certain kind of underwear with the intention of seducing a certain man. I wonder where this is going. Anyway, about Sid's supposed death. He pretended to miraculously survive. Well, Rose is glad that Sid is still alive and she wants to be his lover too. She's still under the impression that he saved her because he was in love with her. So she ends up tagging along with Sid to Lynn firm. During their secret little trip, Rose explains what he'll have to do to get her father's approval for marriage, but Sid somehow concludes that she's trying to convert him to the local religion. Following this, Sid comes across Beta. She was using her alternate persona as the author named Natsume. She's basically published stories that Sid shared with her and became insanely successful. We're talking about Cinderella, Romeo and Juliet, and Star Wars. Sid starts getting excited when Beta passes him a mission briefing that is coded in ancient language. He's still under the impression that all of this is roleplay. Rose is kind of confused. She wonders if Sid is obsessed with things like history and languages. Meanwhile, there is a cultist who invades the Church of Beatrix and kills the Archbishop. Epsilon gets there and takes out one of the perpetrators, but the murderer himself escapes. In the wake of this, Sid relays that he'll be moving on his own accord. Moving on, the Beatrix trial takes place, but no one is worthy enough for the spirit of the heroes to manifest and duel them. The event was looking ultimately uninteresting at this point, but out of nowhere, Sid is announced as the next challenger. As it turns out, Rose registered him in order to show his father that this man is truly worthy of being her husband. Sid didn't want to give anything away to the masses, so instead of going with his real identity, he crashes the event disguised as Shadow. And for once, a spirit does manifest in order to challenge him. Much to everyone's surprise, it's Aurora, the strongest witch in history. The acting archbishop named Nelson comments that Shadow is unlucky to go up against her, considering how she once plunged the world into chaos. But Alexia sees the situation differently. She deduces that if Shadow's presence was enough to manifest Aurora, then he may very well be the strongest man on the planet right now. Not to mention, Aurora was hardly a challenge for him. He casually defeats her and leaves all disappointed. The Shadow Girls are once again impressed by their leader. Also because of Shadow's power, the barrier around the event crumbles and a magic door appears in the arena. Shadow tries to ignore the door, but when it starts following him, he takes the plunge and enters it. Though, just as he enters, another door opens in the arena. This gives Nelson nightmares, and he asks the guards to evacuate everyone, but the Shadow Girls appear. Tell Alexia and Rose to not try anything funny and to enter the gate. Epsilon captures Nelson and enters, too. At this point, Alexia and Rose follow along as well. They fall right in front of Alpha and the others. Alexia states that she tripped and fell into the gate, but Alpha doesn't care. She just starts telling the story. She explains that this is where the hero Oliver severed Diablos' left arm a thousand years ago, and she happens to be the descendant of that hero. Sid, on the other hand, comes across Aurora. It seems she's been trapped here for quite a while, and by quite a while, I mean 1,000 years. When Sid frees her from the confinement, she states that this sanctuary is a prison that serves as the storage for the memories of past heroes, and this is where things get a little chaotic. Okay, so they end up destroying the sanctuary. Aurora and the other legends will lose their memories, but what is in those memories? That's the question. They all pass through and begin to gain a perspective on what's been going on throughout the centuries, how the cult used this sanctuary to commit experiments on orphan girls using the blood of Diablos. Most of these girls died, but some became heroes, like Oliver. This also correlates to the demonic pills we've seen at previous points in the story. They were formed using Diablos' arm. It usually produces these pills once every year. It also spits out 12 beads that are capable of granting limited immortality to the 12 leaders of the cult, otherwise known as the Knights of the Round. Now, Nelson, who was posing as a replacement archbishop, turns out to be the one who created these beads 1,000 years ago. And since the secret is out, he goes full power mode, initiates a multiverse of memory 
memories and starts fighting everyone simultaneously using copies of himself. But Nelson wasn't enough to stop them. All of the girls in Shadow Garden used to be these orphan girls who were experimented upon. But Sid cured them of these side effects. They still had their strength, and you bet they're going to use it on Nelson. Sid and Aurora, on the other hand, reach the very core of this sanctuary, while Delta displays that she's strong enough to kill hundreds of Nelsons without even using magic. She's a berserker. Going back to the core of the sanctuary, it's sealed. And the seal can only be unbroken using a magic sword that was also there. The catch is that you need to be a descendant of the hero to withdraw it, which Sid obviously isn't. The Shadow Girls, on the other hand, teleport out of the sanctuary together with Alexia and Rose. Looks like Epsilon figured out how everything works after going through the cult's research. Nelson is confused, especially since he had just summoned Oliver to fight for him, so he shifts his attention to Sid and makes Oliver fight him instead. Sid is once again disappointed because what he was fighting wasn't really Oliver, but a soulless imitation of this hero. Aurora comments that she'll protect him as a thank you for all the fun she's recently had, but this only furthers Sid's disappointment because it's impossible for him to lose to begin with. He relaxes himself, let Oliver pierce his heart, but then grins and shows him that one of his eyes has changed. Basically allows Oliver to stab him, but he made sure that he didn't hit his primary organs. And now that Oliver was in close range, he killed her using his jaw. Sid wasn't done yet though. He figured out one of the secrets of the sanctuary, how it absorbed magic, and yes, the reason he had trouble with Oliver is because he couldn't use magic. But by concentrating his magic within his eye, he can use it again. Sid just straight up uses magic to unleash an atomic bomb, which reduces Nelson and the sanctuary to nothing. Gone. Reduced to atoms. Aurora kisses him in those final moments and expresses her hope that one day he'll meet the real Aurora and not just her memories. Following these events, Alexia and Rose have been more confused than they have ever been. They come to the conclusion that they'll need their own organization which can go up against both the cult and the shadow garden. The only problem is that Natsume has been with them. Friendly reminder that she's actually Beta, disguised as a published author. Natsume agrees that she's willing to join them in creating this secret organization. Very clever of her now, because she can always spy on them. Anyway, ready for another plot twist. When Alpha goes through the archives of the sanctuary, she discovers that the true identity of the demon Diablos is none other than Aurora. Shadow Garden ends up buying pretty much the entire city of Madlid under the pretense that they will open shopping centers, but the real goal is to gain access to the oil under the city. How American of them. Alexia and her sister Iris come to the conclusion that the cult and the church are involved with each other, but they lack the political power to do anything about it, and so Iris decides to participate in an upcoming tournament, the Bushin Festival. She'll win and gain some political power. Rose, on the other hand, is puzzled because apparently she's infected by the demonic blood. Now, the Bushin Festival is a big deal, where warriors from all over the world show up to devour each other. Sid is intrigued and thinks that it'll be cool if he participates. He'll act weak at first, but then he'll defeat everyone. But he'll need another disguise to pull it off, and so he asks Gamma to use her slime makeup and change his face. He becomes Mundane Man, a knight who lacks both skill and status. An exceptional knight named Anne Rose notices him participating. She gives him sincere advice that he better not participate, and another one named Quinton shows up to teach him a lesson before the festival even begins. Mundane Man ends up provoking Quinton by saying that he's at least stronger than him. This enrages Quinton, and he starts beating up said mundane man. Anna Rose couldn't help but observe that regardless of the attacks he endured, the mundane man still hasn't suffered any injuries. Sid then talks to Skell about who will win, and this is where Skell reveals to him the names of the warriors who are favored heavily to win the whole thing. They're Iris, Rose, Anne Rose, Quinton, and a Dark Knight, whose name is unknown. Later in the day, he bumps into Rose. Rose talks about how she became friends with Alexia and Natsume, but then also mentions how her father has already selected someone as her fiance. That man's name is Perv Asshat, and looks like she'll have to give up on the sword too. Sid was still unaware that this lady wants him to be her husband, so he just casually tells her to follow her heart and do what would make her happy. The tournament begins, Mundane Man wins the first round without even moving. Everyone is disappointed because it looked as though the opponent just cracked, but Anne Rose saw that the Mundane Man simply moved way too fast for the naked eye to see. Going back to the advice Sid gave to Rose, well, she just stabs Perv Asshat in the balls. There's going to be consequences because of what happened, but at the very least, Alexi is ready to protect her friend anytime. Natsume calms her down, however, because she's already aware of Rose's whereabouts. Sid then comes across an elf named Beatrix, who looks just like 
Alpha. She's been looking for her niece. Anyway, back to the tournament. Sid fights a warrior named Goldie. Everyone watches closely, especially Quentin and Anna Rose. They want to know how mundane man will handle this one. Unfortunately, reality is often disappointing because all it takes is a sneeze to knock Goldie unconscious. Meanwhile, Iris has a meeting with Perv Asad, where she sees that the man wasn't injured at all. Back at the tournament, there is a stunning upset because mundane man has defeated one of the fan favorites. He has defeated Quentin and is going to fight Anna Rose Rose in his next match. Anna Rose, being a sweet girl, tries to assert dominance before the match, but is taken aback when she realizes that Mundane Man has been wearing armor that weighs over a ton, and yet he can move just fine. In fact, he moves too fast for people to follow him. But before the match with Anna Rose, Sid's sister comes to visit him. But he shakes her off by saying that he will also hunt for Rose because the reward is huge. In actuality, he admires Rose's resolve to risk everything for the sake of her happiness. Moving on, Sid hears someone playing piano. It's Epsilon. She reveals that she is posing as a pianist to develop connections throughout the kingdom. Alexia and Natsume, on the other hand, are under the impression that the reason Rose ran away was because Perv is a cult Cultist, who's trying to brainwash the king. By the way, Rose's father is the king. Speaking of Rose, she's at her wit's end by this point. The demonic blood is messing her up, and she doesn't want more political unrest in her kingdom, so she decides to just surrender. But then, Eminence and Shadow shows up in the underground. He plays some piano, cures her of the demonic blood, and also gives her some powers. He disappears just like that. This gives her a newfound determination to fight. When the cultists come after her, she kills them all. She also decides that instead of involving Alexia and Natsume, she'd rather be alone. When he returns home that day, he realizes that his sister has been waiting for him this entire time. She punishes her little brother and then mentions how she's going to be participating in Rose's stead. And so she wants him to watch her fight from the VIP seating. Sid obliges, and when the time comes, he sits next to Iris in the VIP seating. The two of them talk about the Dark Knight, whose real identity is Beatrix, the elvish war goddess. This is where Sid realizes that she is actually Alpha's aunt. Anyway, when the time comes for the mundane man to fight Anne Rose, Sid excuses himself and shows up in the arena as mundane man. Perv shows up and sits on his seat. Iris is disgusted by him, but he goes on to say that Rose will eventually return and she will marry him. As for the fight, Anna Rose tried her best to match Mundane Man's speed, but it was simply impossible. She loses, which means that Mundane Man will be fighting Iris next. Now, Anna Rose might have lost, but she's grateful to Mundane Man for showing her that she still has much to learn. She asks him if he'd like to work for her country, but Mundane Man isn't loyal to a flag or a country, so he refuses. All this time, Sid is getting excited at how he's going to win the whole thing disguised as Mundane Man and never show that disguise to the world ever again. The Mundane Man will forever remain a legend. But, well, he forgot to watch Claire's match. So there's that. Which takes us to Claire's next match. Sid sits next to Iris and Beatrix to watch his sister fight. Subsequently, we see the perv drugging the living daylights out of Oriana's king. He thinks that Rose will eventually come to save her father, and that's when he'll marry her. Once he's done with Oriana, he also seeks to kill Alexia's father, who's the king of Midgar. The idea is to cause war and havoc. Okay, going back to the tournament, Claire wins again, but Sid wasn't present to see her victory this time either. Instead, he goes down there, disguised as mundane man, to fight Iris. Iris braces herself, but her instincts scream at her, telling her that she will instantly die. Sure enough, mundane man one-shots her. I'm beginning to wonder if this isekai is just one punch man in disguise. Simultaneously, Rose invades the VIP area together with Shadow Garden. She kills her father, the king, in order to end the man's suffering. This messes up the perv. Rose then tries to kill herself to make amends, but the mundane man stops her. He kills perv's men and finally reveals that he was the eminence in shadow all along. Seeing him makes Rose recall a memory from the past when a young Sid used to kill bandits at night. This one time, he saved her, and in turn, it also inspired her to pick up a sword. Rose realizes that it's too early for her to die. She escapes for the day. This leaves us with Beatrix and Shadow. Beatrix knows that Shadow is a wanted terrorist as well as her next opponent, so she prepares herself to fight him right there and then. The battle begins. Iris intervenes to help Beatrix since Shadow is obviously too much for her. Then there's Alpha. She finds Rose and asks her to become a member of the Shadow Garden. And Rose goes along. Going back to the battle, Shadow pulls out his most destructive attack, which will instantly vaporize the entire city. Seeing this, Iris and Beatrix are too petrified to know what they should do next, but Shadow just disappears together with the attack before anyone gets hurt. This leaves a bad taste in Princess Iris's mouth, while Beatrix gets a little sad and sentimental because she was unable to find her niece again. The news of Shadow breaks to the entire world. 
Sherry hears about it in a foreign land and expresses her desire to one day kill him for good. The members of the Shadow Garden continue their activities on making this the best organization on the globe. Alpha digs Rose to a secret place hidden in the mountains around Sid's childhood village. There she shows Rose the ancient kingdom of Alexandria, which is now the base of operations for the Shadow Garden. Here in Shadow Garden, Rose is given a new label as the Soldier Number 666. She'll have to start again from Ground Zero. And well, as for the man, the Edgelord, the Shadow, Sid is pleased with how badass the recent role-playing events have been. He's thankful to everyone who's playing along. Apparently, he still has no clue that all of what happened is real. The Shadow Garden, the cult, ancient heroes, Diabolos, all of it is real. We see him playing piano once again, and when he leaves, a soul black feather falls on the keyboard. That is right, folks, Eminence in Shadow has only just begun. And that's the end of the video. As always, if you liked what you saw, subscribe to the channel. I'll be uploading a lot of videos just like this, so I'll see you at the next one.